Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, you know, I'm incredibly excited to be at the Computer History Museum with the opportunity to talk a little bit about biocomputing. Um, honestly, it's really a dream of mine. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm coming in from the Boston area where uh, I work at a small biotech company called Asimov. And Asimov's core product are cell lines that we develop and engineer to be able to produce molecules of interest to pharmaceutical partners. Things like antibody therapies, um, viral vector-based gene therapies, and complementing this biological product are a set of software tools that we've been developing in-house that help us day-to-day uh, -day with the design of these genetic systems that we're building. And so for my talk today, I'm kind of excited to go through how we optimize the design of genetic programs for living cells. And the flow of my talk will go in the opposite order of its title, starting with living cells and a very high level definition. Uh, from there, we'll move into what is a genetic program and how do you program these cells? And then I'll end with just touching briefly on some of the machine learning side of how we can actually scale this design problem. And so if you leave with one notion today, it should be that biology computes. Whether it's the lone bacteria floating in the wind, sensing and responding to its environment, and adjusting its internal metabolism to be able to survive, regardless of the molecules around it. Or whether it's the giant sequoia tree that's constantly replicating its program over and over and just driving for ever higher growth. All living cells are executing programs, and they're executing them in parallel. And so to just frame the discussion around what is a genetic program, this is kind of my uh, meaty biology slide for the day, the central dogma. And so shown here is a cell, and within that cell is a nucleus, and within that nucleus is this yellow double helix structure known as DNA. And by analogy, we kind of think of this as the code for the cell or the code for life. And this double helix structure is kind of tightly packed inside of this nucleus. And there exist molecules that can bind to DNA, start to unzip it. And as it unzips it, slide along and transcribe it into this intermediate representation of RNA. RNA can then be shuttled outside of the nucleus. And yet another molecule will bind to it and slide along and translate it into this sequence of molecules that are called amino acids. And as this chain of amino acids begins to elongate, it will start to fold into a low energy form as dictated by the laws of physics. And you can think of proteins as the instruction set in biology. So the shape and size of these proteins will actually uniquely define its function. And the set of instructions are pretty broad. Proteins can bind to and unzip DNA. They can uh, adhere to molecules together, or they can cleave them apart. They can act as transport systems, shuttling information throughout the cell, or they can act as gates, allowing molecules in or outside of the cell. And so when I talk about this kind of analogy of living cells executing programs, it's reasonable to think about software programs that we write. And similarly, there's inputs and outputs to these cells. But instead of kind of electrical signals as inputs and outputs, we'll typically think about things like chemical signals that may be added into the growth media of a living cell that will trigger some input. Or it may be a signal that cascades from neighboring cells nearby. And when we think about outputs, we tend to think about things like um, activating the ability for a cell to be able to move and, say, move in a direction uh, that may be more nutrient-rich. Or in the case of Asimov, an output could be a molecule of interest that we produce that has some therapeutic modality. And so shown here on top of this piece of DNA, of, uh, on top of this cell is a piece of DNA, and we color code on top of that these arrows. And these arrows represent coding regions or genes. So these are regions that when expressed will turn into proteins that perform some kind of function. And when we think about the functionality of these proteins, we break it down into semantically three regions. There are sensors, which are responsible, which are responsible for reacting to this external stimulus and translating it into an internal signal in the form of protein expression, shown as these kind of circles here. Then there's kind of the core meaty circuit logic. So these would be a set of genes that, when expressed, produce proteins that bind upstream of other genes and activate them or repress them, acting like not or nor and or or gates inside of a cell. 
And finally, we have actuators that are responsible for taking this internal representation and actually turning that into some sort of external signal or molecule. And so I show here an incredibly simple Python program that just blocks waiting on user input, and if the user input is large enough, it will print out a statement that's visible to the user. So how would we encode something like this in biology? Well, I show here a visual representation using a visual ontology of a piece of DNA. So this thin black line, you can think of as a piece of DNA, A's, T's, C's, and G's, that's many thousands of nucleotides long. And we semantically label different regions of this DNA. So the most obvious would be output here, this arrow, that represents a coding region that when expressed produces a protein. As we want this to be visible, let's say that this protein is actually uh, colorful and it fluoresces under visible light. There's these hard right arrows. These hard right arrows represent uh, promoter regions. So these are regions of the DNA where molecules will bind and begin transcription, the process of creating RNA. So you can think of this as where programs start. Then there are these Ts, which are the opposite. These are called terminators. These are regions of the DNA that are responsible for knocking off those proteins and ending transcription. So between kind of a hard right arrow and a T, you can imagine like an isolated function that would be executed. And finally, we show here this yellow arrow that is a protein, a coding region that codes for a protein that when expressed will actually bind very specifically to this promoter that's upstream of the output. So in steady state, what happens is you have a lot of concentration of this yellow protein being produced that's repressing the output, and it's blocked. There's no output being produced. But you can imagine if we're able to uh, inject an input into the growth media of a bunch of cells that have this DNA program inserted into them, and if that input is chosen such that it can repress the promoter upstream of this yellow gene, then no yellow protein will be produced and the output will be shown. And so we did that. Um, so we have shown here uh, what's known as a bioreactor. So inside of this bioreactor is growth media. And inside of this growth media are cells, E. coli. And we've engineered these E. coli with a very similar program to the one that I just displayed. And let's see. Awesome. And so you kind of see this uh, blender-like activity in this kind of frothy liquid. This is the cell in steady state, so there's no fluorescence output. But our operator here begins to inject a chemical that very specifically binds to and represses this knot gate. And thereby, the output, you'll be able to see this milkshake start to turn into something uh, quite red. There we go. So over the period of a few hours, we're able to actually activate this gene with high specificity. And so what I just showed was an incredibly simple circuit. But the reality is that simple circuits actually drive most of our modern applications of synthetic biology. So if you rewind back to the late 1970s, one of the original kind of uh, use cases of synthetic biology was the production of insulin. So Genentech showed it was able to introduce kind of a human transgene into E. coli that codes for insulin, grow that E. coli, and produce insulin at a much cheaper rate than what had been done previously, which is extracting it from pig and cow pancreas. In the 80s, we saw examples of synthetic biology. Again, incredibly simple circuits where we introduce herbicide resistance into crops so that farmers can spray herbicides across their population, kill off weeds, but allow the crop of interest to be able to grow unharmed. And even in modern applications, we still see these simple circuits sharing back up. Uh, so impossible foods needs to produce a variant of hemoglobin to have that really rich kind of bloody mouth feel to its impossible burger. And originally it did that by mining this out of um, the, the roots of soybeans, but that's an incredibly labor-intensive process 
And so instead, uh, they actually were able to isolate what the gene is that codes for this protein, and they can insert it into yeast and grow yeast up inside of a bioreactor, a fermentation tank, as you would beer, and produce it at a much cheaper rate. So shown here is just kind of a cartoon at the bottom of, again, these incredibly simple circuits that can be inserted into cells that drive quite a broad range of applications. So you can imagine if we can start to design more complex circuitry, we can drive more complex products. And so shown here are four um, you know, theoretical but under development uh, kind of areas for synthetic biology. Um, so the first would be chemical production. And so you can imagine uh, wanting to produce a biofuel inside of a cell population, but that biofuel may actually be toxic to the underlying cell. So instead of just having this kind of always on gene expression behavior, we we want some sort of uh, regulatory behavior. We want to produce as much of this biofuel as we can without killing the cell and then back off. So you have this kind of oscillatory behavior and the expression level of this output over time. There's therapeutic applications like the ones Asimov work in. Um, and beyond kind of antibody production that I had mentioned earlier, you can imagine therapeutic modalities like editing a gene, adding a missing gene, or removing a gene from a cell population with high specificity to only edit a certain cell line within an individual. There are microbiome therapeutics under development, so engineering your own gut bacteria to be able to sense and respond to their environment. Uh, so for example, if it senses high acidity, being able to regulate it back to normal levels. And finally, smart plants that could potentially sense and respond to their environment for things like drought conditions, notice them uh, ahead, of time, ahead of the drought actually forming and activate drought resistance genes. So when I take a step back and think about what does the process look like for designing genetic programs, put yourself in the mindset of a newly minted PhD scientist who's tasked with building one of these futuristic applications. So the first thing that you would do is likely a literature deep dive. You'll look, what are comparable products that may have been built or systems that may have been built over the years? Can I mine what cell lines that I should be using? Can I figure out which promoters and terminators, which coding regions I should build? What are common gotchas that I should watch out for when I work with this cell line? What are experimental protocols, et cetera? And that can take an incredibly long amount of time. From there, they'll sit down and design this engineered cell line, starting with designing the DNA that they will insert. Um, the most common tools used in industry are effectively text editors, where they'll copy and paste from these papers into a text editor and hope that that sequence will do what they want. And all of us in software engineering probably think this is a bit crazy, right? We're used to working with these rich interactive IDEs that give us a lot of feedback about our code. Um, from there, we would move into a build stage, which is a combination of both human uh, kind of lab operations as well as robotic systems to physically construct this DNA, potentially piece by piece if it's large, insert it into a cell population, grow those cells up, and then finally, some test stage where you hope that the cell now does what you want. And kind of the, the most common form of testing is just staring at your program output. Does this cell do what you want? Did it fluoresce on the time frame that I hoped it would? So there's many challenges in generating these kinds of programs. So again, using the software analogy, we don't really know the full compiler. There's a tremendous number of reactions that happen inside of a cell that we just haven't characterized. We're operating in a legacy code base. So if, you're two -year -old, if you think your two-year-old startup is bad and has a lot of dead branches and old code being used, imagine a multi-billion year evolved program. This program can be non-functional or toxic, so you go through the, all of this effort to build this, and in the end, it doesn't do anything, or worse, it just kills the cell. We talk a lot in kind of CRISPR, and it's been played up, some concerns around things like off-target effects. So will this DNA, foreign DNA that you introduce, interact with other aspects of the genome of this host cell other than what you intended? And finally, and probably most importantly, the feedback cycles can be quite long. So I've probably driven home the point now that it can take many weeks or months to go through this engineering life cycle. And it's incredibly frustrating if at the end of it, all that happens is that your cells die and you don't have any other information. And so the analogy that I always give to designing genetic programs today 
is if you wanted to go and build an airplane, it'd be crazy to just staple together a bunch of parts and hope that it would fly. It worked for the Wright brothers back in the day, but if you wanted to take a flight on SpaceX, it would be insane. Instead, you'd go through kind of this rigorous engineering process where you start with a modeling phase, where an engineer will sit down and build out some specification, like we have a lot of feedback that will give them information about predicted things like weight or cost, lift and drag, before they ever deploy the capital to go into the second stage of physically making it. From there, they'll move into a measurement phase where they'll capture some sort of uh, likely computer-aided design simulation, so things like CFD simulations, as well as some physical tests, so actually firing the rocket. You then may calculate some loss between your kind of expected computational behavior and the real-world behavior, and use that to feed back into the modeling software. And that's the life cycle that we want to drive for in bioengineering. So instead of a literature deep dive as the first stage, what we really want is for biologists to be able to express some specification around a system that they like to build. What genes do I want to turn on or turn off and on what time frames? From there, the make step is very similar, so a combination of both human and robotic systems to physically construct the recommended DNA sequence, insert it into a cell population, and grow that cell population. On the measurement side, we want to do a lot better than just looking at this program output. We'd love to get the full stack trace and understand what's happening inside of the cell at every step within the central dogma. And finally, we want to be using predictive systems, machine learning or otherwise, that can automatically learn from these previous experiments and update the core of the modeling software. And so I'm going to revisit the central dogma one stage at a time, starting with DNA, then mRNA, and then proteins, and just talk a little bit about the kinds of data that we can collect to inform downstream models. So starting at the DNA level, this is the one that we're probably the most familiar with, DNA sequencing. So DNA sequencers allow us to actually verify the DNA sequence of either this small kind of few thousand long nucleotide program that we've built up to sequencing the whole genome of a cell that we're engineering. This can be done on incredibly expensive but high accuracy desktop machines, or it can be done now using incredibly cheap thumb drive size machines. And with all of this, the goal is to just understand what program did I actually build? Just because our software recommends something doesn't mean that the set of chemical reactions that you've run will result in a program that is one-to-one -one with it. So this help, uh, helps us with uh, program verification. Moving up the stack, we have mRNA. So there's kind of a more modern technique that can be used that's called RNA sequencing that allows us at a point in time to freeze either an individual cell or cell population and extract the RNA from it and in one particular setup map it back to its DNA through a process called reverse transcription and then sequence that DNA. And not only does this give us some binary information was something transcribed or not, it actually gives us an abundance measure. So we can look at the amount of RNA that gets produced as a proxy to kind of the rate of execution of a branch of this code. And so what does this look like in practice? Well, imagine some circuit here, and we show the same underlying code. It takes as input three binary input chemicals, so there's eight possible branches that can be executed. And we show on the bottom, kind of the bottom right, on the x-axis, uh, the original circuit, so it's DNA. Again, we color code on top of it different genes as these thicker arrows. We have these promoter regions, these hard right arrows, and these terminators, Ts. And as we look through this data set, visually, we can start to introspect our program and see, for different input states, which genes were turned on and turned off. And for context, the y-axis here would be abundance of RNA shown on a log scale. We can see things like promoters that are actually working, that increase transcriptional activity multiple orders of magnitude, and terminators that uh, decrease transcriptional activity multiple orders of magnitude. And we can even start to see error modes, uh, the fifth one down all the way on the left, you'll notice this kind of cryptic promoter 
So this gene should be turned off. There should not be a lot of mRNA, but we notice that there's probably some sequence homology between uh, a piece of that gene in the middle and a known promoter that's encouraging cells to produce partial copies of this protein. So if, as a human, I'm able to look at this data set and start to understand error modes beyond the cell is on or off, you can imagine machine learning systems can probably start to pick up this intuition as well. And finally, ending at protein level, the kinds of data sets we can collect. So I, always, I already showed you mCherry here. That was kind of the blender that looked like a, a nice cherry milkshake. Um, there's actually a, a nice set of fluorescent proteins. And each one of these shares the common property that uh, this gene, when expressed, produces a protein that can absorb a wavelength of light with high specificity and then emit a different wavelength of light with high specificity. And so we can use instrumentation to actually measure um, the amount of light that gets emitted if we shine a laser on a cell that's producing this fluorescent protein. And the strength of that emission would be proportional to the amount of protein that's produced. And this is what such an instrument looks like. It's called a flow cytometer. And you can actually get pretty high throughput on these instruments. Millions of cells, you can flow through this laser and get single cell reads on the amount of protein as a proxy to the strength of the emission across different spectrum. And the nice thing about this as well is it doesn't just limit us to one single protein output. Uh, we can potentially drop multiple print statements within our program. So we can measure multiple orthogonal protein expression levels in parallel. So using all of this data, how do we start to build to something more complex? Uh, and I show here the Apollo uh, kind of guidance computer or one small component of it uh, that's built entirely out of NOR gates. And NOR is kind of logically complete operator, and so you can build higher order logic from it. So to do this, our founders started to mine a set of genetic gates. Now, this is where the analogy with kind of electrical engineering and software engineering starts to break down a bit. Um, so kind of in an electronic circuit, two gates that are not physically connected should ideally never interact. Whereas in biology, everything is being executed in parallel. So one analogy a professor in synthetic biology loves to give all the time is that a cell is like a densely packed burrito. There's rice and beans and cheese, and it's all just mixed together. And that's more or less what we have here. We have all of these genes that are being expressed that are producing these proteins that can, in theory, bind to and interact with all of these different modalities internally. So we need to enforce orthogonality between um, the genes being produced and then promoter regions that uh, um, the expressed protein will bind to and repress. Um, and so what we show here is kind of a panel of these that were mined. And for each one, we can take the top left example in blue. Um, that blue gene, when expressed as a protein, will bind with high specificity to that promoter, the right arrow shown next to it. And so for each one of these gates, we can start to characterize information about it in isolation. So we can put that gate upstream of one of these fluorescence tags of interest and actually measure as we modulate some sort of input chemical strength, how do we repress this output fluorescence protein? So this is kind of analogous to that uh, yellow protein example that I showed at the beginning. And we can start to empirically measure this. And you see these kind of knot-like behaviors that as you increase the input strength, the output expression levels will decrease. And then we can fit a biologically plausible response curve to all of these. Uh, typically, what's used is something called the Hill equation. And so with all of this information, we were able to build uh, a piece of software to actually design genetic circuits from a specification. And this is called Cello. Uh, it was developed um, in partnership with Boston University and MIT and is publicly hosted uh, on GitHub at BU Cider Lab. So Cello is more or less a programming language for living cells. And to kind of motivate how it works, we're going to go through a classic problem in electrical engineering known as the seven segment display. So from seven segments, we want to be able to display the number zero to nine. And typically in electrical engineering, you would have some uh, electrical input signal that uh, affects which digit is shown. And in this case, we're gonna design cells that when you introduce them to different input chemical conditions, they will fluoresce the digits zero to nine. 
And so shown here is what the input looks like for cello. So a biologist would sit down and design a set of sensors, the input chemicals, actuators, in this case an output fluorescence tag, and then uh, code the core logic in Verilog. And so here it's assumed that the operator, the biologist, is interested in the steady state behavior of these cells and assumes digital logic. So genes are either turned on or turned off. So to build this specification, uh, the first step is actually to just use publicly available electronic design automation software to design an electronic circuit that would act like a seven segment display. From there, we map it using a NOR inversion to a set of not and NOR gates, as in biology, all of our parts act as repressors, and we go through a simplification step. So up until now, there's no biology actually involved in this software. It's all just based on principles of electric engineering. To actually bring biology into the picture, we have to go back to this database of genetic parts that we've characterized and assign them to locations in this genetic circuit. And I'll talk about in a moment why that problem is non-trivial. But at the high level, unlike electrical engineering, where two not gates are more or less created equal, this is not true in biology. Two biological gates may have very different response functions. From there, once we have an assignment that we're confident in, we can forward simulate a signal through these Hill functions and evaluate, um, is the behavior under the different input conditions, does it meet specification? This design is one-to-one -one with a genetic circuit, which can be mapped to a DNA sequence. So what I've shown here is a compiler that takes as input Verilog and outputs DNA. I think that's pretty cool. From there, we can load this DNA into cells. We can load cells into different wells. And we can repeat this seven times for the seven circuits for the seven segments. And then expose these cells to different binary input chemical conditions to represent the different digits zero to nine. And watch as they fluoresce. And so just a little bit of detail on the parts assignment here, given these kind of characterized curves, we can motivate uh, why this is a non-trivial problem by looking at two extreme examples. Uh, we have here uh, two not gates, a yellow and a purple. And they're different insofar as the response function has very high dynamic range for output for the yellow not gate and very low dynamic range in its output for the purple gate. And so in one configuration where you have the yellow gate upstream of purple, its full output response function is actually able to span both the on and off states for the downstream purple gene. But if you were to swap the orientation, that's not true. The purple gene would only ever be able to repress the output of the yellow. And so we can go through a simulated annealing process where we swap in and out gates randomly. We forward simulate the, kind of the, the scoring function or the, the likelihood of this uh, circuit assignment actually leading to a functional circuit as defined in Verilog. And we can memoize uh, circuits that actually perform well. But wait, this is MLConf. I have two minutes left in the talk, and I haven't said much about machine learning. Uh, so I apologize. I'm going to go a little fast through the rest of this, but I'm always happy to talk offline for those that have questions. Um, so Cello works incredibly well and is able to build some of the most complex genetic circuitry to date. Um, but it's still limited. Uh, so first, it assumes that biology is steady state digital logic which is great for some applications, but not true for most. And second, if there's any error modes like that cryptic promoter that I showed before, there's nothing inherent to how Cello models the world such that it would be able to automatically pick up that knowledge from a failed experiment and improve. And to circumvent this, Cello actually requires a separate input, which is a set of uh, kind of known error modes that have been characterized. And the simulated annealing process will avoid those regions of design space. So you can imagine we want a much more scalable approach that's able to predict full time series and analog behaviors, predict oscillatory behaviors, and also learn from new data sets. And so I'm going to frame kind of two related problems. The first would be forward inference. So given one of these genetic programs, can we reliably predict its behavior? 
And so we can design kind of a large number of combinations of genetic circuits. We can experimentally characterize them using the techniques I showed before, RNA sequencing, where we can freeze cells at different points in their growth cycle and measure the abundance of RNA, as well as protein expression levels. And then we can build a machine learning method that can output uh, a similar time series, calculate some loss, and then update our network. And so DeepMob multiomics by propagation is one model that we've built that's performed fairly well on this task. So it takes kind of a one-aught encoding of our circuit design, projects it through an embedding that's learned, encodes it to a fixed size representation. A similar process is done for the set of initial conditions for the system, so the mRNA and protein concentrations at t equals zero. We pass that through. Uh, we've tried multiple different models, but one that I show here is a series of dense layers and a residual network, and then we decode it to a time series representation of mRNA and protein expression levels for all of the genes of interest. And we've worked with many different kinds of decoders, but just a fixed size one is shown here for simplicity. And the predicted solutions uh, actually match up fairly well with the experimentally characterized data. And then we can look at the inverse problem as well. So how do we bootstrap such a model that can actually take a circuit embedding and predict its behavior? How do we bootstrap that to, given a design specification, and access to a database of modular genetic parts actually compose these parts together into a circuit that will meet this design goal? And so this is kind of the simplest form of this generative design interface that we've built out. Uh, it as well only takes as input digital logic uh, in order for us to be able to compare accuracy against Cello. Um, we're able to uh, input uh, a specification around a target time that we'd like to observe a behavior. And we have a suite of algorithms that we've developed that we're comparing. So everything from naive random search, genetic algorithms, simulated annealing, and most recently, uh, we've been iterating on reinforcement learning methods for how to actually sample a policy and compose together a circuit. Uh, and we're hoping to actually commit back to OpenAI Gym, an environment around circuit design. And we kind of have this rich interactive display that shows both the recommended sequence, uh, the output expression behaviors, and the time series of expression. And so combining all of this, kind of our end goal is to create this differential approach to programmed cells, where a user expresses some specification and gets back a recommendation for a sequence. They can physically construct it. They can capture information about this construct at the DNA, RNA, and protein levels, and use that information to feed back into our models. Um, so I just want to give a huge shout out to everyone at Asimov, uh, everyone on the software engineering team, the machine learning team, biology team. I've been working incredibly hard in these programs and the DARPA Automated Scientific Knowledge Exchange program that's helped to fund some of this work. Thank you all.